<laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Our scripture again is, my brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind and straining on to that which is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward. Now, th believe it or not, there are things that we should forget. But the problem is that many of us have long memories. This week alone, I was remembering some of the things that I did when I was younger. Some of them, I'm kind of happy that I did them. For example, when we were younger, do you remember those wonderful uh, playgrounds that we had? Remember them? Remember the teeter-totter? All right? And you'd always go and sit on your friend. I always felt sorry for my friend Raymond Knights. He was such a trusting individual for his own peril. Because we would go up and down and up and down. And then, did you ever grab the, the little handle that was on the teeter-totter? And just as you were going down, you lifted it up real fast. Yeah. And the fella or the gal on the other side would fly up about four or five feet in the air and land on their uh, middle. <laughs> it was wonderful. Do you remember those silver slides? Remember the silver slides? You know, you'd lay on them in the mid-July and you'd get off of them and every part of your body would be red. It was wonderful. In fact... When we moved into the community of uh, Canoe in the uh, in the city of Salmon Arm, they still had that slide. And and remember the swings that had no backs on them? They're not like swings they have today. You would go up in the air, and it was entirely possible. It happened to me a couple of times. I would go up in the air, and then I'd fall off, and the swing would come and hit me right in the nose. It was and then the, the magic old merry-go-round. Remember that? And you always had one. Usually in our town, it was, his name was Brian Massam. Now, Brian Massam was four feet high and four feet wide and weighed 140 pounds. And he thought it was a great thing to be able to grab the old uh, merry-go-round and wave it around as fast as he could go. And when you're 140 pounds and you're 10 years old, and you're four feet wide, you can move that thing pretty good. And all these kids would fly every which way, and he would laugh maniacally, maniac, my, <laughs> maniacally, anyway, maniacally. maniacally, there's the word, maniacally, <laughs> as he did it. It's amazing that we would do that. I was remembering how in my town, every town in, in southern Alberta and throughout Alberta at one time had the drive-in. Remember the drive-in? Oh, yeah. The great big huge screen, our screen was about 60 feet high. Now somebody in their wisdom had decided to put a ladder on the back of that um, uh, screen. And so in the summertime, we would climb up to the ladder and dance on the top of the screen. It was about two feet wide. Maybe it, maybe a, uh, and then we would walk along the side and do that until the police showed up, <laughs> and then we'd run off into the field with policemen chasing us. It was wonderful. It's amazing we survived. Did you have memories like that? I did. It was great. We would we had this old uh, fairgrounds, and they had these long, long. Um, stands, and one of them had a roof on it. Well, you know, it was a lot of fun to climb on top of that roof and run back and forth, back and forth, 30 feet above the ground. And then to jump from the roof onto the building next to it, it was about 10 feet across. And if you made it, it was wonderful. If you didn't make it, it could hurt. I'm just telling you, okay? Now, there are some things that are good to remember, and there are some things that are not good to remember. Strange enough, though, a good memory is not always a good asset. There are some things that we should forget, which we have remembered, and most, 
uh, which cause most of the trouble. It is things that we remember that there's, there are some things we should forget. First of all, the one thing that we should forget is we should forget about our past sins. Those are things that we should not dwell on. And the reason we should not dwell on them is because they will cause us all kinds of difficulties. That why is why Paul said this, I do not consider myself grabbing a hold of this thing. He had not attained it yet. He was wishing to attain it. You say, this is the Apostle Paul. That's right. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians while he was in jail. This was in the twilight of his life. And here he is at the end of his life saying, I have yet to attain this. He says, the only thing that I can do is this. This one thing I can do. He says, I can forget that which is behind. He did not want to remember what kind of man he was. Now, if you read the Apostle Paul's testimony, he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He was well-educated, etc., etc. But he also had one blemish on his past. And that blemish was that he decided he had taken his own personal responsibility to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He had killed Christians. He had imprisoned Christians. He had persecuted Christians. He wanted to forget that. But it was something that would follow him all the days of his life. It was both a testimony, but as well a shame to him. Can you imagine God calling you to be the apostle to the Gentiles? And yet you were the man who up to that point of, on the Damascus Road, meeting Jesus Christ, being knocked off your horse, all of a sudden you are called to minister on behalf of the very person that you had persecuted. It was both a testimony and a shame. He said, I am, he says, I want to forget those past sins. I want to forget those things that I did against people. Do you remember all the pain that you have caused all your life? Knowingly and unknowingly? Believe it or not, if you interact with people, you are going to offend them. You are going to hurt them. You are going to do things that you never thought you were going to do. Especially if you allow things like unforgiveness, offense and hurt to get a hold of you. That's why this morning I encourage you that when we come to our time and place of communion, lay those things before God and say, God, I don't want to have the effect of those things anymore. Forget our past sins. How about forgetting your past failure? Did you have a failure this week? If you lived in life, you had a failure this week. Somewhere this week, you blew it. And believe me, there's always going to be someone who's going to remind you about your failures. If it's not yourself, if it's not an outside person, it will be the devil himself. That's why it tells us in the book of James 5, Confess your failures and your faults and your sins to one another. We must also forget our past successes. You say, wait a minute, should I forget about the successes that I've had? Yes, because what happens to you is you start camping on them, and you start believing that somehow, some way, you had something to do with it. And when you start doing that, you can actually become egotistical, you can be proud, and you can be arrogant. Folks, I remember when I was about 19 years old. Now, folks, you have to understand, when I was 19 years old, I had done several major accomplishments in the area of sports. I was the number one badminton player in southern Alberta. I was the number one long-distance runner in southern Alberta, okay? I was one of the best athletes in my, in my school. In fact, I won several awards. And then when I went off to college, I became a wrestling champion. Folks, I was an athlete par excellence. And often, when I would come into the presence of other athletes, I'd look down at them and say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do this? Not recognizing that God had blessed me with a particular talent in athletics. There was nothing I could not do, and there was nobody I couldn't beat. I would grab a 
a racket, a badminton racket, a tennis racket. I could beat anybody within a short period of time. I was that good. But what that did to me was it caused arrogance and pride and conceit. It's very easy to do. Sometimes you need to forget your past failures or your past successes because what can happen to you is you build upon them and you start lifting yourself up at the expense of others. We also must forget our past pleasures. Let me tell you something about past pleasures. It can literally destroy your life. You start thinking about what you did in the past, and all of a sudden you find yourself like the people did in Egypt. Now folks, here is, here is the Israeli people. They're out in the desert. God is taking care of them. He is feeding them with manna. He is making sure that they have meat and all that sort of situation. And what are they doing? They're remembering what they had in Egypt. When things get tough, you know what we do? We remember our past pleasures. We go back to our happy place where there was a place of comfort. It may have not been a good place, but people do that all the time. We need to forget our past pleasures. We must also forget our past unhappy experiences. Let me tell you something. We've all had some past unhappy experiences. Please do not dwell on them. The reason if you dwell on them, they can cause you despair today. And the Lord wants us to know one thing. He has come to give us life and come to give us to us abundantly. Amen? That's important as well. We must also forget our past blessings. You say, wait a minute. Should I forget my past blessings? Yes. The reason is because God has a blessing for you today. Amen? The psalmist says this. The mercies of God are new every morning. Right? Great is His faithfulness. It also repeats that in the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Isaiah. Did you know that? In all those different places, the Lord wants you to receive the blessing of the day. Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear. God will take care of you. If God can take care of the fowl of the air, and if he can close the, the flowers in the field with such beauty that even Solomon in all his glory is not adorned such as these. Folks, have you been in the last year or so to the St. Albert Gardens? Have you seen some of the beautiful flowers? They're fantastic. I love to take pictures of those flowers. The reason I do that is because every time I look at that picture, I see the beauty of God's creation. Right now, in the state of uh, California, they are having what they call a renaissance of wildfire, or wildflowers, I should say. Right now, there is so many beautiful wildflowers happening in the state of, uh, of California. They haven't seen anything like this in 50 years. Why? Because the last several years, they've had drought. This year, they've had an abundance of moisture, and the mountains have come alive with these wonderful wildflowers. And the interesting thing is, they are actually photo uh, doing photography of these wildflowers from the space station. Isn't that something? It is really something. And yet, God has created everything. You and I don't have to worry about those things. You know what Jesus in fact says? Don't worry about them. Because he says, tomorrow we'll have enough of its own trouble. Basically what he's saying is, trouble comes, trouble goes, but forget about those things. Just let them go right now. Lastly, we must forget about our last sins and failures. So what do we need to do? Well, Paul says this. He says, I forget that which is behind. And I strain towards that which is ahead. Literally what he's doing, he says, I am literally reaching with every fiber of my being. He says, I've forgotten my past. The past is in the past. It's not going to hurt me anymore. It's not going to be, uh, it is not going to be areas for the enemy to do. He's not going to be able to take that information. 
You see, what happens is this, is when the enemy reminds you of your past, do what Carmen says. Remind him about his future. Amen? Remind him about his future. Paul says, I press towards something. He says, what is that thing? He says, I strain towards that which is ahead. You see, there are some things that we need to look at, for example. We need to stretch. One of the things that we need to be looking for is perfection. You say, I can't be perfect. You're absolutely right. You cannot be perfect. But you can be perfect in the Lord. Amen? One of the things that God does when we give our lives to Jesus Christ is He makes us holy. And holy simply means to be separated unto God. That, my brothers and sisters, is perfection. Because when God looks at you, He doesn't look at you the way that mankind. He looks at you through rose-colored glasses. He looks at you through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why John could say with such confidence in 1 John 1, 9, If you confess your sins, He's faithful and He's just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Your aim, your goal as a Christian is one thing. And that is found in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is your reasonable service. That's what it says in many translations. And he says, do not be conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you would know the perfect and acceptable will of God. You know what the... You know what living in the Spirit is all about? Walking in the Spirit is all about submitting your thought life to God. That's what it means. When those thoughts come in and you start entertaining, you know what happens? They become strong thoughts. For example, let's say today, this happened a couple of times. A, a fellow came walking in, uh, driving in, and I walked out there and I said, Excuse me, sir, you can't use that today. And he looked at me and said, can I turn around? I said, of course you can turn around. You can, go, you can leave the parking lot. Not a, no problem at all. You see, what was happening right there is that there, was, there could have been a conflict. But there wasn't a conflict. And the reason there wasn't a conflict is because he and I both chose to take the higher ground. Right? That's what we need to do. We need to not conform to the images or standards, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I made a decision in that moment, and he made a decision in that moment, that we were going to be, you know, and folks, it happens all the time. People have road rage all the time, don't they? They get into conflict over the silliest things, right? But you make a decision. No, that's not where I'm going to be. That's not where I'm going to live. I'm going to present my mind to the Lord. Because I know it's the transformation of my mind that I change my situation. When you allow the Holy Spirit to transform your mind, you will begin to head the right direction. doesn't mean you're going to be absolutely perfect in every situation. Because you won't. Because there's another thing going on inside, and that is the old man. And the old man or old woman doesn't leave too easily, does it? That's why it's called the contention and tension of faith. He says, forgetting those things, he talks about stretching towards. He says, next on, we need to press on to the purpose of which God has taken a hold of us. Do you know that God has a plan for your life? God has a destiny. God has a dream. God has a will for you today. And what you should be doing is asking the question, Lord, what is it that you want me to do today? What is it that, Lord, I can be a blessing? Have, are you looking around to be a blessing? We used to sing a song, Make me a blessing, make me a blessing, I pray. Do you desire to be an encourager? Do you desire to be a blessing? If you desire to do that, God is going to use you in unusual ways. This past week, I, I met a guy that I hadn't seen in months. Hadn't seen him in months. I was, I was praying that I would see him. And all of a sudden, I'm actually it was a young lady, sorry, a young lady. 
And uh, I've been praying that I would see her for months because I hadn't seen her in months. And here I was, I was pushing this iron at the old, uh, at the old uh, gym there. And all of a sudden, she walks up beside me. And I didn't see her because I was so intense. And all of a sudden, she says, Hi, Pastor Dean. Hello. I was just praying about you. Folks, I was. I was literally just praying about her. Lord, I, would, I said, Lord, I'd love to see her. And she walks up behind me and says, Hi. I didn't even, if I wouldn't have been aware of what's going on, if she hadn't done it, she walked right by, I would have missed it. So we got to spend some minutes together talking about what was going on in her life, my life, and then, of course, I invited her to church. She didn't come this morning, but I invited her. And that's what we need to do. You say, invite people to church? Well, yeah. But more importantly, remind them that God is there in their situation. You know, I don't mind being the reminder of the Holy Spirit. I really don't. I don't mind doing that. I don't mind reminding people about God's plans and purposes for their lives. Why? Because the simple fact is that God has a plan and God has a purpose for their lives. And then he goes on to say this. The third thing that we should be concerned about is pressing on for the deep concern of the lost. May I tell you, may I remind you that what we're about to celebrate in just a couple of minutes is what life is really all about. You see, there's one thing that people need to know. This, after, or this morning, we had thousands of people right outside our door, right? Thousands. How many of them have ever heard about Jesus? Nowadays, more and more people are growing up without hearing about Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, there's all kinds of media around them. That's right. But if you're not listening, if you've got a different bent, you're going to do exactly what I used to do when I was 13 years old. When Billy Graham came on, immediately I turned the TV off. I did. Billy Graham, the greatest preacher of the last generation, right? I turned him off. Catherine Kuhlman, she was standing up there. She's, everybody, raise your hands and praise the Lord. And I looked at her and said, that person is a nut. Why? Because I wasn't in that realm. It wasn't until a guy with long hair and a beard on a Saturday morning said, you have tried everything else, why don't you try Jesus? When I went to Havard, Montana, the last thing in the world that I was looking for was Jesus Christ. I wasn't looking for Him. He was the last thing that was on my mind when I went to that young people's. But God had an encounter. And it was the same with the, with the Apostle Paul. When he got on his horse to head off to Damascus, the last thing that he thought he was going to run into was Jesus Christ. And it's the same with you. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it was the last thing that you were thinking about. Maybe it was the first thing. Maybe you were a young person and mom and dad came to you and said, would you give your life to Jesus Christ? And you said, yeah, that would be a great idea. But most of us, he wasn't that. But that's what it's all about. The broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came so that all mankind could be saved. John 3.16 sums it up so beautifully. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you folks ever seen that sign coming into St. Albert? Have you sat there and read all the different advertisements? Most likely not. One day I just decided to do that as I was sitting there at that long light. And I saw all the advertisements for the very first time. I didn't realize that they sold hot tubs at such and such a place. I didn't know that Service Place had this or that. And it went through about ten different things. They're all on there for about... 10 or 15, not even 10, about 3 seconds, right? And it went through there twice while I was sitting there. I didn't know that. 
Because all the time that I'm usually there, I'm looking straight ahead, waiting for the light to turn, because that is the longest light on the planet. <laughs> that and the light coming down from, well, let's just say coming in front of uh, the city hall. I get caught every single time going through. One of the running jokes that I have with, uh, with uh, Jim is how the fact that every time I get caught with, on going to taking him and bringing him back. It happens every single time. I've done it four times. I'll go, eh, stop, go, go, come back, same thing happens every time. You know? When was the last time you looked around? When was the last time you had a conversation with somebody about Jesus Christ? That's what it's really all about. Do you have a concern for lost souls? When was the last time you prayed for lost souls? This morning? Last week? Last year? When was the last time you prayed for your family? Folks, this is what it's all about. At the end of life, you're not going to worry when you stand before the Lord and you're going to list all the things that you, you accumulated. Even your family, you won't be talking about that. What you'll be talking about is, why did I not listen to that preacher? Why did I not listen to that friend? Now, sitting here, obviously, you listened. That's why you're here today. But there are so many who have not. He says, I press on to the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ. Paul had a goal. You have a goal. God has a plan for your life today. It is only the plan that He has given you. God has not called you to sit in front of a microphone and talk to 100,000 people on AM 930 Life. He called me to do that. He called my son-in-law, for example, to sell trucks to men that I would never, ever meet. He's called Leora to be at the Citadel and go sit at different tables and talk to them about the Lord. Because you know what? The toughest people to talk to is old people. And the reason it's so tough to talk to them is because they know everything. Between seniors and teenagers, it's amazing anybody can live. Because teenagers, by the time they're 14, they know everything. And by the time you're 65, you've experienced everything. Right? Isn't it true? You've walked through parent, you've gone through childhood, or childhood, I should say. You've gone through teenagehood, you've raised kids, you know, and, 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 and become grandkids, or if you have that, that privilege. You go through all of that, and by that time, folks, I have sat down with seniors, and I've tried to talk to them about the Lord. Oh, I know all that. No, you don't. You don't know squat. Because if you knew squat, you'd give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. The thing is, folks, people are not looking. But that's why we need to pray that God would open their eyes. Amen. Amen. Paul says, I have a prize. Every one of us has a prize. Every one of us has a goal. Every one of us has a place. Jesus said in the book of John, I go to prepare you a place. He wasn't just talking to the apostles. He was talking to Arlene. He was talking to Lloyd. He was talking to Claude, believe it or not. He was talking to every one of us. He has a place prepared for you. That's why Paul says this. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider yet myself to take a hold of anything. But one thing I do, forget that which is behind. Strain for that which is ahead. I press towards a goal. And I intend to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You are running a race and nobody else is running that race. Kind of interesting what they were doing this morning. There were all kinds of people out there for all kinds of reasons. And they were running a race. Some of them were running for competition. But I can guarantee that about 95% of them were just running for the sake of running. For whatever reason, 
for whatever goal they have, 95% of those know that they're not going to win. But there's a reason why they do it. Folks, we are in a race. And my prayer is that you are straining to win the prize. The prize that God gives you. Paul said this. He says, I run to win a prize incorruptible. I run to win a prize that that day my Lord Jesus Christ is going to give to me. And not only to me, but all who are longing for His appearing. Let's stand together. We're getting ready now to do our communion. I would ask them right now, Lawrence, would you mind going over and playing a little music for us in the background? Appreciate that. And now I'm going to ask...